WebTech 2025 had about 1,000 exhibiting companies, so could I vet them all? Of course not. But still, I did my subjective and selected picks. This company is one of them. And if you don't have time for the full WebTech episode, I'm still placing you the link in the description, I thought I'd cut you out this short portrait. I see 8 times better PFAS removal. Compared to what? Compared to the conventional technologies. Everybody here is so focused on the legacy technologies, granular activated carbon, ion exchange resin, but those were never designed for PFAS removal. While yours is, you designed it only for that? Specifically designed to have the best selectivity in the market to target, capture and concentrate PFAS. So what's the backstory? How did you come up with that? The idea is actually from our CTO, the professor of chemistry, and he heard a lot about PFAS. He's actually an expert in organofluorine synthesis. And he was looking at the water sector and thinking like, if they really want to take it out, they're doing it all wrong. He set out to design something that would be specific to PFAS, would capture it comprehensively. And that's how he came up with the technology. But I thought that activated carbon and ion exchange is good enough. So why would I care that it's eight times better? I would argue that that's not good enough. Eh? Ultimately, we've created a challenge here with PFAS contamination that is not only has all the adverse health effects that people are aware of, but it's very persistent. This is gonna stay with us for decades. We're still producing significantly more than we're taking out. In the end, we actually hear from engineering consultants, from utilities, they would like to see more comprehensive removal. And that's what we're offering. So I would not say that is good enough. It's my fear that people think it's good enough. What I see on your graph is that you're higher, but you're also flatter. Like others will be having different efficiencies depending on, I guess, the type of PFAS whereas you are stable across the board. Yeah, and that's because our capture is comprehensive. So whether that's long chain, short chain, or even ultra short chain PFAS, ultra short chain is not on this graph, by the way. So no TFAs and... Uh... We've tested for that, but that was, wasn't in this specific case study. While you say flatter, yeah, but that's okay because it's near complete removal. So tell me about the regenerable. How do you regenerate? Our technology is actually incredibly robust and resilient. It operates in a variety of water characteristics, different kind of waters, but the regeneration, we can do it in multiple ways. We can apply salt washes, but there's a lot of sites or destruction technologies that don't really like that. But because it's also firmly, incredibly robust, we can use water, but as long as it's at the elevated temperature, when the binding strength of PFAS decreases, and we can wash it off with water. What is elevated temperature? Our material is robust to over 200 degrees Celsius. I can see where that question is coming from. If you think, for example, of uh, ion exchange, those resins decompose at, I guess, 40 degrees C, we can go much higher. So that means that elevated temperatures mean that wherever we have sufficient decrease in the binding strength so that we can use water. So your process is a batch process where you would be running the elimination and then at some point it's saturated, you backwash with that elevated temperature water and then you send that to a destruction unit. Yeah, that would be a option. The thing that we market and position is the right to use our technology. I have a laptop here, it has a sticker on it that says Intel inside. That's where we would love to be with the big technology providers. So that means uh, Veolia comes to you and says, oh, I have that process with my active flow carb, but I think your adsorbent is gonna be better. I might switch one for the other and then do you sell them the product or the right to use the product? So would they go with their recipe too? We would sell that in a package. There's a lot of companies out here, here at WebTech that can design filters and everything around it really, really well. Our technology is pretty flexible in the sense that we are technology agnostic. You can use it in a suspended form. You can use it in a packed bath filter. That would also mean that in that scenario, if it takes us years and years to convince people and they already built a, let's say, carbon plant, we could be able to swap out that material and enhance that performance significantly. Tell me about your go-to market. How do you convince people to adopt you? Our technology is now out there with these technology providers for evaluations. And essentially they bring us the cases. Can you give names? We sign pretty strict NDAs. I, we have some preliminary data. There will should be more data available at the end of this year. A handful of these technology providers are evaluating our technology. And essentially, they have certain case studies, whether that's a drinking water application with high amount of short chain PFAS, they were not removing that. They said, oh, maybe you could do that. Were the challenging things for these technology providers they bring to us, we get a go at it, and then we can see where that takes us. You can do what the conventionals cannot do, but 
but you do it much more expensive. Um, I would ultimately argue that with this regeneration, we go to lowest life cycle cost. So we've demonstrated regeneration at least for five cycles. We can do it on site, which saves a ton of transportation costs. And that means that the cost for using this combined with the ease of use, make it a very strong solution. How do you know when your technology is saturated? Because we are insensitive to co-contaminants, it's much easier to model when our material would be saturated. Others need a lot more continuous testing. The moment that you roughly know your influent conditions, you can time it much more specifically. So when you say roughly know, it means you need to know the PFAS loads in the stream. So you still need a PFAS measurement. Sure, you need some measurements and you, you do need that information. What we're seeing now is that all these pilots are taking place. All these cases are being studied before technology selection happens. That gives you a ton of information, but now you're much more reliable. And if there's high organics at some point, that's fine. You still need to address those. Our material won't touch that. So that means that it's just PFAS focused. Take me to the future. Let's say 2030. Where are you in 2030? I hope, and I hope that also for the sake of society, that comprehensive capture gets much more traction. Instead of focusing on just maybe one or two or a handful of compounds, while there are tens of thousands out there, I hope that the sector moves through that comprehensive capture. And that means that we are in a great position. At that moment, if we do not already have a significant market share, we'll be in a great spot to go and swap out those inefficient technologies. That's the vision for 2030. Now we reverse this engineer that. What needs to happen in the next 12 months? I can't wait for our current evaluations to wrap up. We have a few big grant applications that I would love to hear the yes on. And then we are in a position to go and meet that demand of these technology providers. When we do that, we can scale so that means that next year we're looking at one or two projects. That's a very realistic step up and then move up from there. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the explanation and looking forward to that. That's it for today. If you have a bit of time left, YouTube believes you should go watch this. And if you wonder why I picked this company, happy to discuss it in the comments and I'll see you next time.